Welcome. This is the Life Habits Podcast series, and my name is Carl Vredenberg. This is the series that helps you to learn new habits to optimize your life in order to stay sane in this crazy world. This is episode number 56, and the topic for today is Get Up and Move. And with that title, you may well also know the guest that we have on for this session it is uh, marie Jose Char, who was with us previously as well in a couple of other sessions before. And you know that her overall approach and strategy is focusing on sleep, food, mood, and exercise and building essentially healthier habits with regard to all of those together as well as individually. And we've talked about her overall approach in the past, and we're going to be doing a drill down today on the topic of get up and move. So uh, welcome, Marie Jose. It's a pleasure to be here, Carl. I really like that you're back again. And this is a topic as we move through your sleep food, mood, and exercise topics. We're doing drill downs on each of them in turn. And we have had other uh, previous podcasts that were drill downs as well. But I did want to remind all of our listeners here of your background. I haven't done that in a while. You have a degree in organizational behavior from McGill University in Canada. You have a Master of Applied Positive Psychology from the University of Pennsylvania in the United States of America. You're a personal trainer and you have certification in that and also have nutrition and wellness consultant certification from the American Fitness Professionals and Associates. So lots of credentials uh, there that I think those who have listened to previous episodes we've done together know also means that there's an awful lot of appropriate research that is behind everything that you say, which is also uh, in some of the feedback that they gave us in previous sessions, they also particularly appreciate it. So with that, the topic for today then is overall get up and move, a focus on fitness. And as you now know the process so well and what we do in terms of doing some inspirational quotes and then getting to a top 10 list. Maybe we can get started on a quote to start us off. Absolutely. It's a quote that I like, uh, actually love, from John F. Kennedy. He said, physical fitness is not only one of the most important keys to a healthy body, it is the basic of a dynamic and creative intellectual activity. And uh, we will talk a little bit further about that a little bit later, but uh, there is a lot of research that backs up this claim. I love that quote too, and uh, find that it reverberates so well with the various topics that we're going to get to very soon. And I know you've also got a particularly nice way of thinking about people needing to change and really getting past where they are currently. I wonder if you could just describe a little of that sort of overall context before we get into the top 10. Yes, absolutely. People change when they feel that the status quo is no longer attractive or that the change is easier than maintaining the status quo or actually actually maybe not easier, maybe just more attractive than maintaining the status quo. So um, our top 10 today, will go over that whole process. First, we're going to talk about strategies to make the status quo unacceptable. Then we're going to talk about strategies to make the change easier. And we're going to make uh, the change a little bit sexier at the end so that we've addressed all of that whole process of change. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. All right. Well, as a first, very first intervention, even before we talk about those 10 strategies, um, I'd like to invite people listening to the podcast right now to just stand up. As you are listening, you can listen just as well standing, standing up as you can sitting down. The difference is that if you are standing up, you're keeping your metabolism higher. It's revving for you. You're burning a little bit more calories. You're, you're building your muscles that are helping you have a tall and proud posture. And so why not? Why not take double benefits as you are educating your mind? you can also uh, train your body. All right. So first of all, I said we were going to talk about making the status quo unacceptable. And to do that, I'd like to bust the most common excuses that I hear when people say that they can't exercise. And to do that, I'd like to uh, share another quote with you, Carl, at this moment. Mm -hmm. It is that bureaucracy defends the status quo long past the time when the quo has lost its status. So that's a very interesting quote, and I would like to invite people listening to us right now not to do that mistake, which, which has been shared with us by Lawrence Peter, an American writer. Don't make that mistake of defending your excuses past the point where they're no longer serving you, and let's just bust them. 
Yeah, in fact, most people on this topic probably have very, very well-practiced excuses yes. that you're going to go <laughs> through now. And I think the having the inertia to get past those and get out of the comfortable zone of saying, well, no, these are my standard reasons. No, you got to get past these reasons to really get moving the overall uh, uh, focus. So we're already standing up. So now we're going to focus on the getting moving. So go ahead. Exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> What's number one? <laughs> number one is mother of all excuses. I don't have time. That's the one that we hear the most often. And it's true. Modern lives are busy. The phone is ringing. Email is waiting. There's a lot of work. The kids, the soccer practice, this, that, the next thing. But here's what we have to think about. Exercise builds the brain. Literally, not just it makes it a little bit more efficient. It helps build brain cells. So through increased blood flow, our, our brains build stronger connections, improve memory, promote insight, facilitate deductive ability. All of these things, these things are going to make you more productive so that you can be more efficient throughout the rest of your activities. It will help you decrease mistake rates. It will help you feel a little bit more resilient as well because exercise boosts the production of serotonin, which makes us feel cool, calm, and collected. It also boosts the production of dopamine, which makes us feel more energetic. And it decreases cortisol in our bodies. And cortisol makes us feel stressed. So it does all kinds of good things that help us tackle our day more productively. So if exercise is productivity, then definitely it's worth carving the time. So you'll find yourself after you've really got involved in an exercise program and getting the benefits that you just described, Marie-José, you'll be more productive. You'll also have more time to actually exercise. So if you're more effective yes. uh, in your day-to-day -day work and you're not sluggish and your brain isn't just slow and you're actually exactly. doing appropriate exercise. And like you say, it's a whole body thing. You get benefits uh, right across the, all the spectrum of the various aspects of our body. You're that much more more efficient at what you're doing and more effective at what you're doing. But the other thing you might want to add in terms of this notion of you don't have the time, you also have to just make the time when you look at how important this is to any of the other things that you think are important to life. When you right. think of, you know, career, well, you want to keep doing that. So you not only want to be very effective at doing it and be, like you say, the, achieve the benefits that, of, uh, of a well-tuned body and mind, but you also typically want to live healthier and longer. And one of the ways to do that is to realize that this is probably the most important thing that you can do is making sure that you are, you know, healthy and are able to, you know, live a long time. Absolutely. People who exercise have a longer time, a longer life expectancy. So there you go. You've got more time, right? right? And people say, well, it's today that I need the time. Well, maybe you don't need to work quite as many hours if you know that you can work a few more years into your retirement. And if you have very difficult tasks to do, research shows tackling them right after a cardio session is the, the best time for you to do them effectively in a short amount of time. So very, very good thing to consider. Okay, we now have no longer been able to use the excuse that we don't have the time. We're now convinced yes. that we're past that one. Good. So uh, strike that one off the list. What's number two? Number two is I don't have talent. You know, people will say, oh, I can't do it. I can't bring myself to do it. I never have. I never will. Well, here's my little secret for you guys. There are two broad mindsets, growth mindset or fixed mindset. People with a fixed mindset think that they have a limited amount of talent in a given category, in this case, exercise. Because they have a fixed amount of talent, anything that is challenging is useless because they won't be able to push their comfort level or push their ability level past what they, already, what they already have. If they make a mistake or if they don't do well, it's a proof of their own limited ability, so they don't like that either. People who have a growth mindset, on the other hand, think differently. In their perception, whatever amount they have today is reflective of how much effort they've put into it in the past. And if they start putting more effort into it in the present, then in the future, they will have in improved their capacity. So if you think you don't have the talent, adopt a growth mindset. Because research shows that whether you think you can or you can't, you are correct because it's going to turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy. So start believing that with effort, you will... And indeed, it's going to work out. The other thing to think about, too, in addition to all of that, is this notion of 
that the human body was made to do the things that we do when we exercise. Yes. You know, the, the, the human body was made, everybody's mo- body was made to run, yes. uh, to jump, to, to, to move, right? And I think a large part of our day-to-day work these days when we sit around and, uh, you know, are in meetings and all these things that are non-physical, we're just not exercising. We're not doing the very thing that our, our bodies were made for. So in, in some respects, this notion of having the talent they have the growth perspective, as you say. It also is the case that your body was made for this. Yes. And that you just need to be able to get out there and do it. It's not incredibly difficult to get doing any of these things because your body basically has the core ingredients to be able to do this anyway. Yes. It's counter nature to sit all day long. That's why we're right. all standing at this moment, right? Right. right, <laughs> right. All right. So the third excuse that I hear most often is I hate to exercise. And when we dig a little bit later, people hate to exercise because they don't get in flow. So let me explain that concept a little bit more. We have a skill level, as I just mentioned, and there's also a challenge level. When our skill level matches the challenge level, we easily get in flow. That's when we can develop ourselves. That's when we are challenged just enough and we feel we're progressing and we really enjoy it. However, if we try to meet a challenge that's too high, for our current ability, then we become anxious, right? So if someone uh, has to run, let's say, two miles inside 20 minutes, and they're only able to walk, uh, you know, at this point for about 20 minutes, and then they're really tired, or if they run, they can only run an interval of a minute or less, then telling them to run 20 minutes is going to be a total disaster. They're going to be anxious. They're going to hate the process. Mm-hmm. Same thing for someone who does run a 20 minute, two miles in 20 minutes, telling them that now all they have to do is to, to run a mile and a half in 20 minutes, they're going to get bored. You know, they won't like the intervals where they're walking to make that 20 minute mark. So in that case, we will need to increase the challenge. So think about what it is that you don't like about exercise. Are you getting anxious or are you getting bored? If you are anxious, decrease the challenge until your skill level improves. With the growth mindset, it's going to get there. And if you are bored, then reduce the challenge. So, uh, sorry, if you are bored, then increase the challenge. Yes, that's right. Increase the challenge so that you can feel like there's something in there for you to enjoy and tackle. It's a great way to to think of it, Marie-Jose. I think the other thing that I would add was that when you are about to increase your skill level, that, you know, early on, if you're really out of shape, and you really want to just basically get started on it, you don't even think that you could do it, start really small, but, you know, get an accomplishment under your belt with even a, you know, short distance, like you say, it might even be a a five minute, you know, uh, yes. run or, or walk, and then you build it up. But as long as you do it regularly, you now are going to get to the point where surprise, surprise, in a matter of a week or two, you're going to now be able to do more. And you can get that level that you just said, that sort of threshold level to be more challenging, you can now up it a little. And if you push yourself just a bit past what is that threshold level each time, you'll get that training effect, right? What's beautiful for people who are absolute beginners is that they don't need to change into workout clothes and sweat and shower and all that. You know, they can just five, find five minutes, 10 minutes in their day and go for a walk and already they've accomplished something, right? So it's easier for them. And then the next day, they, maybe they can do 12 minutes already. It's an accomplishment. It's an improvement. So it's a great process. I think the other thing is that in order to do that gradually and still be pushed along, I mean, I know there are obviously, if you're going to go to a gym, you can get a um, a trainer and the like to go mm-hmm. a, and help you with that. And, and all of that is good. But again, trying to make this as applicable to everybody as possible. Not everybody's going to be able to do that. Not everybody's going to be able to afford that. But if you also have electronic devices like iPods, iPhones, and the equivalent from other manufacturers. There are also, I've seen some really good iPhone, iPod apps for this very thing of getting started and giving you guidance as to, okay, now you need to run for like a minute or two, and then you walk for a minute or two. And then the next week you're up to five minutes and then you're up to, you know, 20 minutes and the like building up, but it still organizes your, your, your focus uh, sort of moving, moving forward. So I think some level of guided, you know, progress on this, you know, might be an idea as well, right? Right. What gets measured gets managed. So great piece of advice, Carl. Right. (laughs) The the last thing on this one, uh, before we move on, is that I know 
We talked before, too, about the whole notion of, of endorphins. I know that you're uh, fond of speaking about, and, and I think our listeners also really appreciate your uh, sort of more scientific and medical sort of approach to a, a lot of these topics. One of the benefits when you start to get to a level of fitness that is beyond sort of the beginner stage. Yes. Now you're, you know, you can say now that you hate exercise. Yeah, because you're out of shape. But if you get to the level where you're really getting into some decent shape, you turn the corner. And I've told uh, listeners of this podcast series some number of episodes ago, a couple of times that I've gone through that cycle and gotten to a level of fitness that where the endorphins kick in where yes. you know I didn't did a, a 10 one particular one that I remember and there were several uh, like this but one in particular the first time I ever experienced it was a 10k run finished the 10k run felt so good that I did another 10k <laughs> and when you're starting, you think, ah, that's impossible to do. But it isn't when you get to a level of, uh, of fitness where it's self-reinforcing. Now, again, it's a reinforcement that our bodies were made for this. Yes. When we actually get to a level of fitness that is commensurate with what our bodies are, in fact, able to do, then they start to take off on their own. Right, right. And there is some research that shows that exercising outside uh, gives us even more benefits than inside. I guess it's because it's bringing us closer to our nature in a way. Um, so I'm sure that uh, for people who hate to exercise, maybe trying outside instead of a gym setting might be another way to bust that excuse. But across whatever it is that you're going to be doing, I think your, your overall theme is get up and move. So <laughs> just get going with, with something. We've got the three excuses and uh, no longer have those to be able to have as crutches anyway, anymore. Right. Uh, Marie-Jose, what's next? Well, next we're going to look at four strategies to make the change easier. And you said at the beginning that my whole model works around sleep, food, mood, and exercise. So we're going to look at that. If you take a look at your whole life, it gets much easier to manage change than if you just look at one thing in isolation. So in this case, if we're trying to exercise more or more effectively, and we only talk about exercise, we're missing the point. So let's talk about how sleep can contribute. Sleep increases leptin, and leptin is the manager of whether you are willing to expand your energy or not. So more leptin, more willingness to spend the energy that you've got, good thing. Sleep also reduces cortisol and increases serotonin, as I've said earlier, both of which make you feel more resilient, make you feel better able to tackle challenges. Again, very good thing if you're trying to uh, exercise. I just re-listened to our last session together where we talked about sleep, and you did also make the point during that session that we should also make sure, though, that we are also doing our exercise some distance from the time that you start yes. to want to go to sleep. So I might want to you know, remind everybody to do that as well. That's true. That's true. If we exercise vigorously right before bedtime, it might keep us up because right. exercise is a stimulant. But if uh, you get rid of all the cortisol, as you say, as we talked about during that episode, you're also going to be able to sleep better. And the more you sleep better and get restorative sleep, you'll be able to get exercise better as well. And that's your overall system, right? Creating a very positive cycle indeed. So our next strategy is food. And here I'd like to insert another quote, this one from Virginia Woolf. One cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not dined well. Well, to what she's saying, I'd like to say one cannot exercise well either. You know, if we have um, energy dips throughout the day because we eat, you know, things that are either too high of sugar or because we skip meals or just because, you know, our, our food habits aren't the best, well, it's going to be difficult to want to exercise. We need high energy throughout the day. So good nutrition, sharing our meals, you know, somewhat evenly throughout the day, not waiting five hours between two meals are strategies that can help. Here's the other thing about food that can really contribute to our ability to exercise. High fat diets make it harder for our muscles to use oxygen. And if our muscles can't use oxygen easily, then our heart has to work harder for it to do its, for, uh, for the muscles to do their work. And that makes exercise a whole lot more difficult. 
So a lower fat diet, and I don't mean, you know, go nuts and buy everything that's low fat. There's a lot of not so good things about these products. Very often they're higher in sodium or higher in sugar, which isn't any healthier at the end of the day. But, you know, just trying to balance out, you know, not don't go for all of the full fat products everywhere. Maybe buy skim milk, maybe reduced fat milk, choose leaner cuts of meat, maybe eat a little less meat, for example, just so you have a balanced diet, not a high fat diet. Avoid, avoid fried foods, of course. That will make it easier for your heart to do its job while you are exercising and thus helping you, you know, going a little longer. Your focus on food, making us being able to exercise better to keep with your overall system of everything feeding back into one another. Mm -hmm. After you exercise well, after a while, you also start to more naturally eat healthier as well, right? You'll end up craving yes. more naturally foods that are better for us over time, you know, as well. So it starts to be a self-fulfilling and self-reinforcing system. This is great, Carl. You impressed me. You remember our stuff so well. <laughs> <laughs> You've taught me well, Marie-José. <laughs> so we've got sleep and we have focused on food. And yes. what's next? The next one is mood. So good mood makes us feel more capable in general. But even more interestingly, there's a research that shows that the research was done by Robert Emmons. And it shows that people who keeps who keep a gratitude journal not only improve their mood, but they tend to exercise on average 90 minutes more each week than people who keep track of their hassles. So, you know, writing a couple times a week, here are the things I'm grateful for this week, will help you feel not only, you know, happier and more grateful, but also like you are capable of a little bit more exercise. Very interesting and probably, um, you know, unforeseen correlation. I have certainly talked uh, in this podcast series in the past about the importance of being positive, you know, gratitude and expressing that more and the benefits of all of that. Here is an instance now where, again, there's a benefit that is unforeseen, as you say, that talks about if you have a good mood, you have a positive approach to life and any situation that you think about that's occurring in your life, you take a positive approach to it. It's going to make you even more effective at doing your exercise as well. And here I, I want to be careful not to overstate the research. The research didn't say that there's a causality. So because you keep a, a gratitude journal, all of a sudden you're going to start exercising 90 minutes. That's not what the research shows. The research sh says that people who do keep a gratitude journal tend to exercise more. It could be because they exercise more that they're more grateful as well. Who knows, right? There's right. not necessarily a <clears throat> linear causality here. But through my whole model that shows that sleep, food, mood, and exercise are mutually reinforcing, I think it's definitely a sign that if if you work on your mood, um, you, you will get benefits on the exercise uh, category without it being the causality of the gratitude journal per se. Yeah. And they Am I making sense? One another. Yeah, absolutely. Makes okay. sense. And it's good to be cautious about the interpretations of findings like that, Marie Jose. I think the notion of, in this case, it's showing there's a correlation, which means it could go either direction or it could be due to some third variable exactly. still as well. Exactly. But in this case, what you're saying really is that the overall elements of the entire body are reinforcing one another. And right. if there's a particular aspect that could possibly further improve your effectiveness in terms of exercise, it's not only looking at sleep, it's not only looking at food, it's also looking at mood and anything else. Yes, our last way to make exercise a little bit easier, research shows that shorter dura duration and higher frequency are helpful. So just like taking a shower, you know, because you do it every day, uh, you don't wonder, am I going to exercise? Am I going to take a shower today or am I not? You just do it every morning or every night. Well, same thing with exercise. Do it shorter and do it every day so that it's part of your routine. It's part of just who you are and you just can't skip it easily. Your body's going to say, hey, something's missing today. You know, you didn't exercise this morning. The other part of that is the non-negotiable self-talk. People often will start wondering, well, is today a good day? Maybe tomorrow will be better. Let me try to figure it out. And the moment you start arguing with yourself, you know you've lost the battle. So make it shorter. Do it every day and don't negotiate with yourself. Just go for it. Just do it. It becomes ingrained and it's easier to maintain. I love this one. 
Marie Jose. I think this is one, and I think you also talked about this in one of your newsletters, where, and we'll talk about that a little later in terms of the mechanism that you also use to make information available to people that may well want to sign up for that. But I remember a particular issue that talked about this, which is basically that a lot of the other advice that is given as things like you should exercise three times a week or maybe four or four times a week. And then as you say, you have a lot of people thinking about, well, you know, is today that day or not? And you uh, engage in the self-talk that you just mentioned yes. of saying, well, is today that day? No, let's make it tomorrow. I don't really feel like it today. I better make it tomorrow. And then it ends up being the next day. And then before you know it, you're no longer, you know, engaged in a program anymore. And if you were right. to be, you know, not as exhaustive in terms of the actual time that you take necessarily every day at it, but that you focus more on the very theme of this whole podcast series of developing habits. It's all about developing the habit and the habit, like you say, the basic hygiene habits of, you know, you just brush your teeth yes. you know, first thing in the morning. You wouldn't think of leaving the house without doing that. Right. And so you Hopefully. also, right, now you also <laughs> want to make exercise as regular and habitual as all of that. And so I think that it's probably more important, as you say, to focus on the developing the habit and then over time developing the appropriate, you know, time that you're going to take on it at this stage and at the early stages, it's more important to actually make it habitual. Yes, absolutely. If it's part of your routine, it becomes part of your identity and then you don't skip it. People who are uh, aiming for three times a week, well, they're aiming for the minimum, right? And as part of your identity, you're not one who shoots for the minimum, are you? Right? Right. Exactly <laughs> right. You know, I think we also have talked in the, in the past about other aspects of getting things into becoming a, a habit. And there's probably this one, we've talked before about the notion of you know, whether you need to get into a gym, whether you need to do all kinds of other things that are usually impediments to people getting started. If you are introducing the notion of making things more involved to get there, that will likely lead to the possibility of you not doing it. I think, again, it's, it's in line with your thinking here is to make it simple, make it something that you can actually go out and do, whether that involves actually something that involves going to the gym or going and uh, just running outside or whatever. Don't use anything or don't introduce anything that is going to be an impediment or is going to give you a possible reason not to do it. You've got enough reasons certain... already. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly right. Okay, so really good work. And so we've talked on, I think this is number seven we're up to. Uh, what are we going to focus on next? Um, well, now we are going to find ways to make exercise more attractive. So when people think about exercise, they often think of smelly t-shirts and sweaty jogging pants. And that certainly doesn't sound sexy, so people don't do it. So let's find ways to make exercise feel more attractive so we can get over the, you know, not so fun aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And the first way to do that is to use your strengths. And here I'd like to introduce a quote by Martin Seligman, whom I've had the pleasure to work with, an absolute genius in psychology. He says, when well-being comes from engaging our strengths and virtues, our lives are imbued with authenticity. So if we use our strengths to benefit our exercise, it will become more engaging more energizing, and it will feel more authentic. So it doesn't feel like it's that thing you're doing because the world tells you you should, but rather it's something that you do because you know how to engage into it in a way that, that is stimulating for you. So here are a few examples. If you are high on curiosity, for example, well, try to work uh, on something new at each workout. So you're discovering, it's making it interesting for you. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're high on perseverance, Maybe you can count the number of days in a row that you can exercise or how many weeks in a row you're not going to deviate from the routine you've set for yourself. If it's humor that's making you tick, then try balancing moves because as you're trying to balance yourself, you're going to make funny movement and that might, that might be funny for you. It's going to make the whole routine a little bit uh, more engaging. If you're high on kindness, work out with someone in need. If you're high on the love of learning, try new disciplines each quarter. So those are all examples, and they're only examples, but find out what your top strengths are and then see how you can express those through your workouts. 
And, and you want to make this over time be something that is what you would define yourself to be, right? Yes. So you look at all those various dimensions. Those are sort of your own core strengths and areas of focus. And I think over time, when you do that and you personalize your approach to exercise, you also will start to develop the concept that you're the kind of person that is fit, Yes. That is a person that actually does this kind of work. And I think a lot of people that are reluctant initially to begin doing this kind of exercise and have the excuses that we just went through at the top of the top 10 list, you know, when they really get engaged in doing this and personalizing it as you just described it, I think over time they also start to think of themselves as being people that do this. And once you start to see yourself as somebody that is fit and is into fitness, I think you also start to be even more effective by internalizing that view. Absolutely. I am writing a book right now, and the very first thing that I suggest is decide that you are a healthy person. You know, you said decide that you're fit. People might say, well, I am not fit, so I can't convince my, myself that I am. Okay, maybe you can't convince yourself that you are fit. How about convincing yourself that you're active? Decide mm -hmm. today, I am an active person. And then the next day, decide again, I am an active person. And when you've done it for, you know, two, three weeks in a row, then you'll realize I am now an active person. So make that decision, decide how you want to be, and then do what you need to do in order to be that person that, you, that you've always wanted to be, or, you know, that best possible self that's in you. The other thing that you probably were mentioning in passing was that you also, you know, want to actually invest a little in making this something that is important to you. Yes. And so, you know, if you've got the sweatpants and that's your old, you know, concept of how to do this, in order to consider yourself and feel good about the fact that you're doing this, you might want to buy some appropriate sort of exercise gear. And that also will further reinforce this notion that you're the kind of person that does this and you're an active kind of person. Absolutely. That's not part of my top 10, but it should have been. You know, if you feel good in your gear, if you've got the appropriate equipment, if it's not risky that you're going to hurt your yourself because you know your shoes are not the right kind of or something like that it's definitely going to help you get out there and do it okay we're now up to i think number nine yes number nine is add meaning um, so for some people it might not be about the exercise per se maybe it's about maintaining better health so you can play in the yard with your grandchildren when you have them or if you have them already it might be about making sure your loved ones don't have to worry about your health you know if we know that the number one killer in america right now is heart disease there's a lot of people worried about their loved ones so exercise to save those worries to those around you. Maybe you want to honor the body God gave you. Whatever it is, add meaning, infuse meaning into your exercise and into your activities so that it's not just the exercise for the sake of exercise, but exercise for the sake of something bigger and more motivating. Or train for a cause. And the other one that may be related to eight or nine in terms of the way that you're describing this, I know I may have mentioned previously in the podcast series that uh, my, my brother is heavily into uh, exercise and does significant events like uh, marathons and, and Ironman and all that kind of thing. Good for him. And one of the things that he feels very strongly about is, which is I think related to both of these, is also making exercise more social, actually making it such that you uh, go out with a group of people uh, mm -hmm. to go do this stuff. I know there's a running room is a, uh, an organization that does this on a regular basis, and it increases the likelihood of you being compliant and going out and doing it because you have people that are just not going to take those, those excuses, Marie-José, that you yes. introduced at the top of the list, right? And it's also going to be you know, not as focused on banging the pavement with your feet in terms of doing the <laughs> exercise by, by yourself, you're also making it much more enjoyable. You're also going to likely be, you know, reinforcing each other more and encouraging each other uh, forward. Yes. Uh, you can also get some challenges in terms of, you know, wanting to keep up with somebody else that's there. If there's some level of healthy competitiveness that may well drive a level of increased focus that may help you as well in achieving your, your goals. So that's the other one that I would add to the, the description that you've provided. You know, we're back to the excuse of I don't like it. Some like to exercise in groups. 
Others like to exercise alone. Some like to master their bodies. Others like to chase a ball. You know, explore different things. If you've always just done the same thing, if you've always just hit the pavement with your running shoes on your own and you've always, you know, hated exercise, well, try a competitive sport. Maybe try something, you know, that's more artistic, like ballroom dancing. You know, maybe mm-hmm. maybe you just haven't explored enough all the possible avenues to make it so that it works for you. Now we're up to number 10, I think. Yes. Last but not least, use the peak and rule. Here's what the peak and rule says. Of any event, no matter how long or short, we remember most the peak and the end. So if you go on vacation, no matter if it's a one week, a two week, or a three month vacation, there will be a very clear peak and the end. Those are the two things that you're going to remember most. And if you like those, that's how you're going to judge your whole vacation. It was a great vacation or it was a poor vacation based on how high was the peak and how high was the end. So let's use that rule to our benefit with our workouts. Let's plan for a good peak and let's plan for a good end. Um, If you are a runner, run at your, um, you know, max capacity on your favorite song on the iPod. That would be a great peak. If you're working out with someone, maybe exchange massages at the end. That would be a great end. If you like, um, you know, in yoga, we tend to uh, end with a very relaxing pose, just lying down and deep breathing. And that's very, very calming. That's a great end. So yoga goers enjoy that, you know, and go back not just for that pose, but it's helping them nourish that love of yoga. So manage for a good peak for yourself. Plan your favorite activities, plan your, um, you know, buddy activities strategically and then plan for a good end so that you overall start to increase your liking of working out a little bit more each time. I find that when I'm running and I listen to a variety of different things during sort of the first part of the run, if I'm really trying to push myself and either really enjoy it or just push to hit a Uh, more significant goal that I have for myself. So I'm really getting tired and you need to get the reserves sort of going. Mm -hmm. I I always have a a playlist that has music that I wouldn't necessarily share with anyone because it's very private, but it's (laughs) very, very uh, motivating. And it it just sort of pushes you the extra, extra step. And then you achieve sort of the objective that you had, but you also achieved it, as you say, with the right level of Uh, sort of context, or in this case, you know, music as well. The other thing that I I noticed, you know, people will do is sort of, and we've talked about this on this podcast before and a variety of other topics as well, this whole notion of setting yourself some goals. You talked before about the notion of measurement, so you can measure your progress and the like, and that that may at times be useful. We often, when we're talking about really getting to a peak, if you ask a lot of people that have, you know, done let's say a lot of running, they will also describe some of their absolute peak moments as being when they cross that finish line of the first marathon they ran or, you know, 10K or, or whatever it is that they were doing. Do you have any thoughts on sort of the approach? We, we've talked previously in the podcast about the notion of being reasonable and setting yourself some goals. Yes. Uh, and then, but then, but also making them small enough so that, you know, you're not, you're setting, you're not setting yourself a goal of, you know, running a marathon and doing that in three months. If right. you're starting from zero, that's pretty crazy. And you, you know, might right. not uh, well achieve that. But I wonder if you have some thoughts to offer too, with regard to the approach to setting goals. Yes, I, I have two thoughts. And the first one I've already mentioned is set goals that are going to put you in flow so that you're not in that anxiety zone or in that boredom zone. So tr- okay. try to yep. stretch yourself just a little bit at each workout. And the second thing is micro goals. So rather than say, okay, you know, today I can run two miles in 20 minutes. I would like, you know, in six weeks to be able to run three miles in 30 minutes, you know, add one more mile at the same pace. Rather than just do that and look three months ahead, look in this workout. How can I set myself a goal or multiple goals in this workout. So let's say um, I am lifting. Well, I usually do uh, 13 reps with a certain um, weight category. Well, today Mm -hmm. I'd like to do 13 reps with 
five more pounds, or maybe I'd like to do 16 reps, just a micro goal. You know you're done your goal inside a minute, so you can't give up on that goal, right? It's just a minute. And then maybe you're going on the treadmill and you're going to say, well, I'd like to run um, the longest distance I've ever ran inside two minutes. It's a micro goal, very short, very manageable, keeps people engaged. And you're, you know quickly if you got it or if you don't so that, you know, you can um, quickly give yourself a little break if you need one too, rather than get discouraged. So micro goals are very, very helpful. Really good advice on all of this in getting people up and going. And a quick reminder to just make sure you go see your doctor before starting an exercise program like this. And one or two, just as we're finishing up, I had mentioned earlier about your newsletter that I read. Just wanted to ask in sort of wrapping up here where people may be able to find more about you and that sort of thing. I wonder if you could just uh, let everybody know where where they should go. Of course. Thank you for opening the door. (laughs) My website is smartsandstamina.com, spelt out fully, smarts, S-M-A-R-T-S, and A-N-D, stamina, S. T-A-M-I-N-A dot com. On the left-hand side, there's a sign-up box for my newsletter. I email every two weeks. Each issue is research-based. It always gives one concrete tip people can try today for free. And it takes less than 90 seconds to read. So very short emails, very applicable. Um, I get good reviews for those, so I think that they're helpful. I hope some people, uh, you know, take the chance to, to try it out. I also have an upcoming book. I am hoping to release it in May. So people who sign up for my newsletters will get special offers um, and will know exactly when it's out. Can you give us an idea as to what the focus of the book is? Yes, yes. It's 50 strategies for better sleep, food, mood, and exercise habits. Um, So things like we've discussed today, except that it's going to be a self-coaching book. So we're asking people some questions and leaving some room in the book for them to answer them and to write down whether it worked for them or not worked or how to, you know, how to improve it next time and leave traces so they can come back and see how that, that worked for them if later they need to come back to it as well. If some people have listened to previous podcasts with you, Catherine Britton has done some podcasts, I believe, and she is my co-author on that book. So uh, we are putting our talents together. Excellent. Well, people that have listened to this podcast series have heard from both of you and will, in fact, hear uh, Catherine coming up in the next short while, too. We're also planning another uh, follow-on session. So reading your words, uh, collective words in a book sounds great. And so uh, I can also endorse the uh, newsletter that you mentioned earlier and the website. And I love the name of your company. It sums up well the overall focus and the benefits that you're going to get from doing work that Marie-José advocates. So I want to again thank you, uh, Marie-José, for this session. I know we do these now on a, you know, fairly regular basis, and I really appreciate your contributions, and I know our listeners do as well. And I'd like to suggest that anybody that's listening that wants to provide more feedback to the podcast series, this episode, or any others, you can go to the regular places, which is at Life Habits at gmail.com if you want to send an email. You can go into iTunes or the Zoom store and provide any ratings or reviews and comments. And uh, you can also go to lifehabits.net and provide feedback there as well. So thanks again, Marie-José. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And we'll talk to you all next time. And bye for now.